I'm, I'm Alex. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO here at Snorkel. I'm also uh, currently an affiliate assistant professor at University of Washington. Got to work with some great students there on also uh, data uh, data centric and, and weak supervision and uh, you know data management for ML um, uh, type stuff. And um, yeah, I've been working on Snorkel and data centric AI since about late 2015 um, with my uh, my co-founders back at Stanford. So. Really excited to talk a little bit today about you know what foundation models mean for data centric AI development and that concept in general. I'll, I'll introduce what we at least mean by that concept as well, and um, kind of give a high level overview of some of the themes you'll probably hear from other snorkelers, uh, Faye, my co-founder Braden, and others throughout the day, as well as um, you know maybe some themes that overlap with the uh, the other exciting set of speeches uh, or set of talks, I should say. So um, thank you all for joining, and really excited to get kicked off. Today, I'm going to talk at a very high level about, you know, how, in our view, foundation models intersect with, interact with, and, and really accelerate the trend of what we call data-centric AI development, meaning at a very high level, the idea that AI development is primarily done via operations on the data and especially the training data that machine learning models learn from, labeling, curating, sampling, slicing, augmenting, et cetera, um, versus traditional kind of model-centric development where the input training set is fixed and you're just kind of tweaking, tuning, building custom model architectures. Um, so let me jump in. I think for most of us that are here, again, we talked about uh, some, uh, maybe I said the phrase selection bias already once, but um, I'm assuming most folks in the room have some awareness of the exciting upswing in, um, you know, uh, pick your scaling axis, you know, number of parameters, compute, amount of data, et cetera, basically the, the upswing in, uh, foundation model or large language model progress. And uh, just as a quick intro for those that are kind of new to this space and, and certainly you know new to our terminology here, um, you know, first I'll start with the the, the phrase foundation model. Uh, a lot of these uh, are referred to as large language models. Uh, this is based on their genesis around text. And this is a decades old idea of, of you know, self-supervised techniques where you basically predict you know, what words are you going to occur uh, around or what words are going to occur around you or what phrases within a window. And in this way, you can use vast corpora of unlabeled data to self-supervise a model that can predict and, and conditionally generate, um, you know, more text. And so this is, this is why these are traditionally, again, decades old uh, techniques called language models. As they've been scaled up in, in really, you know, step change order magnitude ways, we've started to call them large language models. And you have these really incredible emergent properties. And then as they've crossed over to other modalities like image, video, and multimodal settings, and in general, as they're now being used as kind of building blocks for other more targeted use cases, we'll get into that more, uh, we often like the term foundation models. So that's what you'll hear me use today. And I'm sure many uh, of us can, can pull out examples from our Twitter feeds and also from the academic literature and, and potentially even, although I would, I would gamble, um, uh, less frequently from real use cases uh, in production. Stunning examples and demos of, of how these models, um, you know, are making incredible progress. Here is just a, a quick uh, tweet from Dali and, and a little snippet of uh, chatting with ChatGPT. And, and really there is clearly a step change and a really exciting one that we don't even fully understand happening uh, with the scale of the foundation model. So it's a really exciting time to be an AI and to be uh, interacting with foundation models. But many of you probably are here, uh, or at least uh, uh, you know, we're excited about the remaining gaps. And in particular, you know, this is just a sketch. Pick your axis. You know, if you see kind of the excitement and the kind of open benchmark uh, progress of foundation models, and then the actual return on investment, the actual value. Um, I'm using the phrase enterprise here, but this really just means kind of real world, high value production use cases. Um, most folks that we interact with as customers, uh, um, uh, as you know, uh, collaborators and, and through discussions, uh, feel a gap that is widening between the actual value they're getting out of these techniques and the kind of acceleration. And I don't just mean foundation models, I mean machine learning and AI in general. And here I've kind of you know, roughly sketched what you could kind of point to as two you know, very, um, very public and exciting inflection points of late, you know, first with deep learning models coming out into general usage, and then now with this kind of foundation model uh, uh, era. So what's what's the gap? Well, you know, unsurprising probably given all the other stuff. If you've if you've seen any of the snorkel material before, uh, academic or commercial, 
we're very focused on not the only, but one of the major kind of causes of this gap, which is the fact that to actually take this open pro academic open source progress and actually apply it to specific high value um, you know, uh, settings, you actually need to use data to fine tune and otherwise adapt. And this you know, training data gap is often what explains the reason why you know, the fact that chat GPT can, you know, compose amazing and, and, you know, 85, 90% plausible sonnets about coding interviews and Dolly can create images of raccoons or, you know, uh, astronauts on, on horses can't immediately out of the box just be applied to complex real world or enterprise AI problems. So the key idea I'll, I'll just sketch today is that the future of foundation models and more broadly, if you're excited like we are about how foundation models are taking over, um, AI more generally is really about uh, data and data centric operations, especially from the user uh, or developer's perspective. So let me give a kind of basic definition of what, what I mean by model versus data centric development. Um, the, the, you know, high level idea is very simple. In traditional machine learning, if you went to, you know, maybe not Stanford's intro ML course anymore because my co-founder Chris there, but, you know, if you go to a, um, you know, standard kind of ML textbook, you'll often see uh, you know, a, a basic setup, at least for supervised machine learning, where you're trying to train a model to, you know, label or predict or, 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 or um, you know, or, 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 you know, tag something. Um, you'll see kind of two basic steps. There's the, the you know, training data set, a bunch of labeled data that the model learns from, learns how to, you know, do the task by kind of fitting to or, or learning from this training data set. Then you have the actual model, the architecture, the algorithm used to train it, et cetera. And in classical machine learning, the training data set is something exogenous to the problem. It's a set of X, Y tuples that you're just handed by some annotators or some line of business or subject matter expert partners or you know, download from Kaggle or a benchmark data set if you're, if you're on the academic side uh, traditionally. And then that's when you start doing your model development. And AI development is really about iteration on the models, the features, the hyperparameters, et cetera. Conversely, Data-centric development is, you know, in its in its kind of zero to one form, is the models are fairly fixed and push button, and the architecture is fairly fixed, and you know the algorithms and, and infrastructure is fairly standardized, even across broad problems. And iteration is done primarily via, lab via labeling, curating, sampling, slicing, broadly, you know, developing and curating the training data set that teaches this model. And, you know, one of the stunning things that you can start to see happening is that the actual innovation in new foundation models and new foundation model progress is increasingly driven by data centric development and and new techniques and new data sets around you know, you know what what these models learn from more so than kind of core step change architectural or infrastructural improvements um i just did a bunch of sloppy copy and paste copy and pasting here but if you look at recent models stable diffusion whisper t0 is something that the, the team here contributed to with many others out in the open uh, awesome project, Flan, ChatGPT, et cetera, you see all these instances where, you know, there is pretty much at a very high level, at least standardization in the model architecture with these, you know, transformer-based architectures. There's still a lot of, you know, secrets and, and tricks of the trade that are giving people advantages in the infrastructure side, but abstractly, that is also standardizing. And what you're seeing is increasing creativity and diversity and leverage gotten from the data what data sets you curate, how you label them if you're in the stages of, of, of you know, uh, fine tuning or pre-training where you're doing supervised uh, things, how you curate, you know, prompt data sets or label data sets, or how you set up these flywheels for reinforcement learning, learning you know, based uh, human feedback. All of the latest progress is about this, you know, careful curation of data. And there's an increasing body of academic literature that also kind of talks about how the leverage from curating data more carefully um, compares to you know tweaking the architecture, and just like in in, in deep learning, the 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 difference of of data versus you know particular model uh, parameterization or, or sorry I should say model hyperparameterization or or structure is is you know significantly more weighted uh, to the to the data. So we're already seeing behind the scenes that foundation model development and innovation is becoming data centric, and and more importantly from at least what what we often think about what I'll talk about today. From a user or practitioner's perspective, I'll go one step further and say that foundation models make AI even more necessarily data-centric than ever before. And it's a very simple rationale. 
you know, imagine you're taking a foundation model that you've prompted or more likely in a production setting um, fine tuned to, you know, label a customer interaction as, uh, uh, you know, normal or, or you know, problematic. Um, if you find out that your model is making a mistake on a certain subset of customers or a certain subset of complaints, you can't go back to this multi-hundred billion parameter foundation model and just claim you're going to tweak some parameters or come up with something new and clever in the architecture to fix that problem. You have to go back to the data and do something involving labeling, sampling, curating the training set that's used to further fine tune this model and make corrections. So, you know, foundation models don't just, um, well, they certainly don't get rid of the need to label and curate data. We'll go into that. Not in real settings. And they don't just kind of keep the status quo. They actually make model centric development from the user's perspective, at least almost impossible in a practical sense. And so having the epicenter of AI development be around the training data. Um, and again, you could extend this to the prompt sets, the, 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 re the RLHF based supervision, but more broadly, the, the supervision data um, is just a, a necessary and even more strident transition. So that's one high level idea. And, and I'll start zooming in on why foundation models only accelerate the trend from model centric being the, 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 you know, the central way that AI is developed to data centric out of necessity because these models are just too complex and black box to actually admit for any practical model centric develop by, development by the practitioner. So if you buy that premise, even partially, let's dive a little further and, and ask, you know, what will data centered development look like in the foundation model era? And there's a ton of exciting stuff here. Uh, I'm, I'm going to just kind of give one view of one axis. And, um, and this is kind of going from, you know, initial generic self-supervised training to you know, target task fine tuning, ton of diversity of, of the ways that you can you know, um, you know, condition, supervise, train these models via data uh, of all kinds of different types. But one axis to call out that I think is very interesting is this, this um, spectrum from you know, what we mostly look at today, which is these major you know, efforts to, to you know, create a big generic foundation model that's been self-supervised on some massive you know, dump of, of usually web data. Um, and then you know, at the end, and this is the world that I'll talk about in a second, you know, at Snorkel we often live in is then trying to take this model and fine tune it for a specific uh, target task and a specific SLA of, of accuracy. And that's done with, you know, with labeled training data, of course, in, in most production settings when you're really trying to get high performance. But there's this really exciting spectrum in between of successively kind of training uh, or fine tuning and narrowing this big generalist model. So we're starting to see coming in from the left, you know, examples of not just, you know, models uh, uh, trained on, you know, the whole internet, but trained on specific subdomains, which is, you know, not a new idea. Um, it's a quite classic one, but that you can take these pre-trained models and then further kind of fine tune or pre-train them in self-supervised ways on smaller target data sets. Uh, for example, the Stanford Center for Research on Foundation Models, um, uh, where, where my co-founder Chris is at, uh, recently released a PubMed GPT, which is just a, you know, a generic model that was further fine tuned on unlabeled medical data. And we'll see a lot more of these. And then from there, you can go and do things like in the T0 and FLAN papers and many others, where you then start to actually um, fine tune the model on you know, labeled data or specific prompt sets um, in a multitask fashion. So you start to kind of zoom in on the area where you actually want these models to perform. And then you can get to the final, you know, stages of, in most cases, when you want production accuracy, fine tuning on a labeled training set for your specific task. So there's a ton of additional diversity in how you supervise uh, and, and in a data centric way, kind of develop these models for specific things you want to do with them. But at a high level, this is one axis I think is extremely exciting. And, you know, here is kind of what most of what we've seen so far. And then for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to talk about this last mile, which is, you know, what really determines uh, in, in production AI what ships and what doesn't. And that's where a lot of our work is focused and, and we'll talk about for the last, you know, five minutes or so. So let me just start by framing kind of challenges and opportunities, and I'll briefly talk about some of uh, the ways that we're tackling it. We've put some stuff out there 
uh, a month or two back. And uh, my co-founder, Braden, is also going to be giving a more in-depth view of how we're actually instantiating that, uh, this, this kind of these approaches in our platform snorkel flow. So if you want more detail, there's that talk and there's stuff online, but I'm just going to give a high level sketch. So let's start with the challenges and opportunities of this kind of last mile into the spectrum. And I want to start with a, with a kind of basic definition of generative versus predictive or discriminative AI. So, you know, generative modeling is the, uh, you know, idea of actually generating the full data distribution, you know, the, the, the data point X and the label optionally. And uh, predictive or what's more formally called discriminative modeling is uh, you're trying to take in a data point and predict some kind of output, you know, target label. So, for example, you know, generative modeling or generative AI might be generate some, you know, uh, uh, conversational dialogue or text for uh, a user conversation. And predictive or discriminative AI may be something like detect if some, someone said something uh, offensive in a, in a chat room. And one thing, this, this table is not perfect, uh, but I'll, I'll talk through it quickly. The, the abstract or, or, or kind of theoretical difficulty um, uh, of generative is, or, you know, let me take a step, let me restart that sentence. In the abstract, you might intuitively think that generative modeling and generative AI is, is far more difficult than predictive, right? It seems much more difficult to generate a whole paragraph or, a, a, you know, a, a detailed image than just kind of label whether, you know, the text was offensive or whether there was a, you know, a certain event in the image. And, you know, intuitively and theoretically, in some sense, that is absolutely true. It is more difficult to, you know, learn the full, you know, uh, generative distribution versus a discriminative model. But the key in practical settings is that most generative AI today and, and likely into the near future is only, uh, you know, being held to a kind of fuzzy or, or, or kind of, you know, good enough bar. In other words, even measuring the, you know, quote unquote, accuracy of some text you generate is a, a non-trivial thing to do. And most applications that we're seeing are really about human the loop um, type or fuzzy success measure settings. Whereas in real uh, world predictive AI, you're aiming to automate something usually with extremely high and reliable and robust accuracy. So when you take the actual type of generative versus predictive AI and you actually match it with the, the bar that you need to hit to ship something, it actually flips. And at least in, in, in all of my experience, you know, predictive AI is significantly more difficult, at least in, in, in you know, complex high value settings. I'll give a quick example, and I know I'm, I'm running short on time, but um, Faye, I think we can uh, go maybe till 925 and then take five minutes of Q&A based on what's in the, what's in the queue. So quick example, um, we have our, our beloved little octopus logo that we like. It's actually a, an octopus uh, that looks a, a little cuter and less scary than this, this kind of, you know, uh, dark blue octopus, uh, you know, uh, giving a, a muscle pose. Um, uh, and it also has a snorkel, not just a scuba mask. I couldn't get it perfect, but I actually had a great time. This was a, with a, a, I forget which version of stable diffusion. I did about 30 iterations and I got this octopus and I think it's, it's pretty cool. Not perfect. Couldn't get the snorkel, et cetera, but pretty cool. So from a generative perspective, that process of just kind of, you know, creating about 30 samples and picking out the one at the end that I liked the most was a, was an awesome experience. But if you flip that and think about it from the predictive perspective, you know, one in 30 is like a 3.3% accuracy rate, which is just beyond unacceptable for a predictive application to ship to production. So that maybe gives a little kind of intuition about the flip between generative success and predictive success. Another intuition is that we're trying to take these foundation models from kind of big generalists and, and train them to be specialists for a specific task. And, you know, just like a human, and it's dangerous to draw, you know, human AI analogies uh, because they're often very misleading. But in this case, I'll, I'll venture forward just because a human, you know, imagine a human has read, you know, all of Reddit and all of Stack Overflow and has a bunch of gener generic knowledge like these foundation models. You'd still expect they would need a little bit of specialist training before they're able to see patients or analyze complex legal documents or do something, you know, highly bespoke and technical uh, with high accuracy. So same thing here. That's another intuition for this. So a lot of what we're we're um, we're seeing, you know, is you've got this axis of I, I should pick a better, better better term here, but kind of how bespoke is the data? Is it well represented in the generic web corpora that these models are trained on, or is it much more specialized? And then on the on the x-axis, what accuracy level do you have to hit? Is it good enough to just have you know something that generates plausible samples that you can use in a human loop process, or do you need to actually hit a very high and robust accuracy bar? And a lot of where foundation models are doing 
stunning things is kind of, you know, out of the box or, or sorry, in, is in this kind of lower left quadrant where, you know, you're okay with kind of an 80 to 90% good enough. Um, you know, sometimes it'll just be very confidently and objectively wrong, but, you know, you have a good enough kind of, um, you know, generation uh, uh, bar. And then you're working around kind of generic data that's well represented in the web data that they're trained on. But most kind of high uh, impact, you know, I'm calling it and saying enterprise applications, but this could be, you know, something for, you know, uh, nonprofit, you know, triaging of patient pipelines or, 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 or something like that, just something where there's, you know, a high accuracy bar and, and it's, you know, bespoke and complex data. That's where these models don't work out of the box and you need to fine tune them or adapt them with uh, 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 labeled data. I'll also just quickly mention that deployment in, in the real enterprise, uh, many of the customers we work with is, is really over the next couple of years going to be, in my view, a, an unsung challenge. It's extremely expensive to, uh, to, to ship these models, to run them, and even more, um, uh, I think what will be an even bigger blocker in the coming years is around governance, model risk management, explainability. We, we, we barely understand the emergent phenomena of these models. Um, you know, large enterprises like banks and government agencies and hospital systems are still working on getting, you know, model risk management improvement for, you know, deep learning models from four plus years ago. It's going to take a while here. So the net result from all of this is even if you can, uh, you know, uh, you know, adapt your foundation model um, to your specific target, you know, complex predictive accuracy, uh, predictive AI task, you know, deploying is a whole other challenge. So how do we solve these challenges of adaptation and deployment for these kind of real world you know, complex, bespoke, high accuracy, predictive AI problems. That's a lot of what we've focused on. And since I'm about out of time, I'll leave this uh, uh, mostly for my co-founder, Brayden, uh, later. There's also, you know, lots of demos and stuff online. But the high level idea is, you know, in, in our platform, Circle Flow, and through techniques that we've published about over the course of this year, um, on the academic side, you know, we're, we're working on ways to kind of, you know, fine tune and, and prompt and distill these massive generalist foundation models into kind of what we call, you know, smaller specialist deployment models. And we do this through a suite of features Braden will talk about, uh, Warm Start, which uses foundation models out of the box to label your data um, using, you know, zero and few shot techniques, uh, a prompt builder where you can then iterate and refine the, the prompting of these foundation models to, to, again, respond to errors in their labeling uh, out of the box and improve and refine them along with other data-centric and programmatic labeling techniques. And then finally, the ability to then, you know, fine tune or train whatever model uh, for deployment, whether it is a large foundation model or a smaller deployment one that you can actually ship in your org today. So, um, you know, the net result we're really excited about is actually kind of bridging the gap between these big foundation models and these predictive AI enterprise settings. And my co-founder Braden will talk more about that. So uh, let me pause there. There are a ton more ideas, uh, both related to what I talked about today and, and, and you know, branching out from that, from the great speakers today. Thank you all so much for showing up. 